It's Chris, the Natural Progressive. I am here today with Lord Hugh Laura Dumbass, his YouTube channel. And if you are not subscribed to Lord Hugh Laura Dumbass, you are a dumbass. Um, <laughs> 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 Welcome, Hugh. Um, say hi. And then I would like you to go into a little bit of your background so people know uh, your credentials or your expertise and, and so on. Okay, that's good because I have I have virtually no expertise, no credentials whatsoever. Me either. Yeah, it's, it's nice to, to meet you, Chris. Finally, I've seen a lot of your stuff, and um, yeah, I've been I've been running a channel for about a year, trying to do a, kind of an experiment in activism that didn't right. really work, didn't really pan out, but uh, uh, it's kind of morphed into sort of a lifestyle <laughs> and uh, yeah. the lifestyle has, has wound up being you know harassing xr and uh basically trying to be the gadfly on the gadfly <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> right right so um what started what what was like the motivating factor to get you into doing this and um uh, what did you find out that like i have to talk about this yeah so i I really kind of got worried in about 2012 and I started doing this uh, alternate reality game as a kind of a, you know, um, a way of, of waking people up and a kind of uh, novel form of activism. But um, yeah, I went until last year. Uh, I thought, I'd, you know, I was getting all of it together. It took me about five years to get together. In the meantime, I, I sold up in, uh, in Seattle and uh, took to sea so i've been sailing ever ever since uh, since 2016. um and i thought i'd go i'd go to sea and then you know basically run this uh this alternate reality game as, as a puppet master and um use it to get people into almost a cult really i guess of uh, you know t drag people down the rabbit hole of thinking differently about mm -hmm. you know basically the crime, climate crisis and, and just how bad I thought things were. But <clears throat> I got kind of caught out in uh, 2018. By the end of 2018, um, I started promoting, I did a year of videos. I did about seven, I did 10 videos actually. And then I thought I'd start promoting them on social media. And I went out on social media and I, I suddenly realized that I was completely out of touch and way behind what everybody's thinking was. I thought everybody wow. was pretty close to where I was. <laughs> and I, I suddenly got a big shock because I realized it's, it's kind of a psychological problem turning it around. And uh, I, we haven't got very long to do it. And when I suddenly realized, you know, hang on a minute, where these people are now, there just isn't enough time to turn around psychologically that, you know, we have to be such a transformation that I've suddenly realized it isn't going to happen. And I so for yeah. the last year, I've been kind of, you know, pitched into doomerism. Um, Me too. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's got worse because since, you know, that epiphany that we're not going to make it is, uh, has got worse because, you know, I, I've got deeper into the science and into the news and it gets, you know, worse and worse all the time. So, you know, it looks like we've passed tipping points and stuff now. So it's, good. it's just getting more, more and more bleak. But anyway, I, I still hold on to this kind of uh, belief that, you know, it's, it's not a binary switch. Everybody goes a bit binary, especially in the doomosphere, I think. And I think, well, if there's no hope, then, you know, just, ah, uh, we just keel over and die. And I can't be there, though. I mean, I yeah. don't have any hope mind you, but I'm not going to just stop talking about it, stop trying to make people understand. Yeah, well, I think you and I think the same way, and that's that, you know, you don't want to be too anthropocentric about it, and it's not all about us. Right. So right. Yeah, it's kind of, um, you know, this guy McPherson thing about, oh, you know, um, we can't do anything because our hands are tied because of the McPherson paradox, and... And, uh, you know, if we drop global dimming, that'll bring on our extinction faster. And it's like, yeah, but is it just about us avoiding extinction or avoiding collapse or something? It's like, you know, we've got a whole yeah, ecosystem and it's, it's, there's a lot of graduations on it. Every, every micro degree that we, you know, actually 
keep the temperature down is you know probably a bit of ecosystem and a few species right. that survive and i mean i i'm i'm not um you know a misanthrope and i uh that's the other thing is you get a lot, a lot of mis misanthropy and you say well this uh, civilization doesn't deserve to live people aren't worth saving and i must admit i after you know, hacking away on, on Reddit and stuff, I do get to the point where I think, you know, this civilization, I mean, these people are really not worth saving. They, they couldn't save themselves, uh, you know. You know, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a sad part is, gosh, did the humans deserve to, to, to keep going if they keep go going along the way they are with absolutely no concern for the rest of the planet? It's just all about them, um, not even realizing and it's logical that the rest of the planet is not going to survive if we just keep taking and taking and taking from it and polluting and polluting it i mean we're we're taking nature and turning it into garbage basically um from the food water and air all of that is 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 just being destroyed and then you'll have they'll they'll sit there and blame it on the individual which you know we all have individual responsibility yes but what good does it do for me not to idle my car? Not that I do, but if if they're the coal plant operating, you know, a county away is is pouring all that pollution into the air and polluting and mining and destroying the land and the water from mining it and processing it and transporting it. Um, don't you think they should be focusing on bigger things? And and they never talk about preserving the wild and rewilding in in all the talks with the green new deal that is in fact it will do exactly the opposite and that's really one of the things i wanted to get um into with you today. yeah you touched on this with Derek Jensen, didn't you? That, that it's really an economic stimulus package and that's what i've been trying to get people to realize that there's an ironic thing in you know telling um really kind of Whiggish, um, uh, hopeful uh, liberals that, you know, believe that, oh, it's, you know, I think there's a big thing that people primarily b believe that climate action involves something about recycling, um, just getting green infrastructure, and uh, new sources of clean energy, um, getting work and, um, and home. Uh, you know, equity and all that. And yeah. stuff like that. And it's, it's like, it's got nothing at all really to do with those things those are really peripheral um it's really got to do with with land use and particularly the oceans and i get really upset about the oceans because now i live on the oceans and um, i'm actually in touch with nature <laughs> um you i think sailors are probably more in touch with nature than anybody these days liverboard sailors and um people talk about the ocean as if it's just a side issue, especially economists. They they treat it as if it's an externality. So, uh, when you talk about geoengineering and acidification of the oceans, you know some this uh, crazy guy, uh, this Doctor Strangelove uh, guy called um, uh, Keith, uh, Doctor Keith. Uh, he wants to do um, solar radiation management with sulfates um, and. Uh, yeah, he says, well, you know, we, we have to do this at some stage. And sure, we sacrifice the oceans because of, our, of a certification. But, you know, it's kind of like a, a, uh, um, you have to, you know, just make the bargain. And I'm thinking that it's so upside down that to me, uh, life on land is an extension of the oceans. If the oceans are where life came from and it's where life is, uh, basically, you, we, as the species go extinct, they'll fall back to the oceans. If you undermine the oceans, you're undermining the foundations of all life. But economists talk about it as if it's, well, there are going to be impacts on agricultural and fisheries, and we'll have to see about replacing aquaculture, but there are substitutes. And you say, like, are you seriously kidding that all an ocean is to you? Like people like Stieglitz and these guys is all the, all the ocean is to them is, uh, you know, basically, you know, sea fish, fisheries and aquaculture. And uh, you, th you think like, 
seriously, dude, we are out of sphere. We're going to die. We are absolutely yeah. going to die if these people are given, they're given Nobel Prizes for saying this bullshit. Um, right. Actually, horseshit is nutritious, so they're not saying that. Um, yeah, the thing is, if they're, you're only focusing on fisheries and not focusing on the whole entire ecosystem, the whole ecosystem is going to collapse anyway. So, but they, they're these... talking about using the oceans for genetic engineering, like uh, seeding with kelp. Um, the primary thing why you can't do these things like kelp um, and, and seeding the oceans with iron and stuff is because the, what economists don't understand about technology, they're completely techno technologically bl blind. they kind of technological infants, and they see technology as kind of this uh, magic uh, gift-giving cow that always, you know, that never stops giving. It's kind of the giving tree for them, uh, but they don't understand it at all. And the, and the primary thing that I've said quite a lot these days is what they don't understand is, <clears throat> is that technology allows you to exchange limits. What we're really doing is we rearranging stuff. The economy is a bigger rearrangement of stuff. You take stuff out of the ground and then basically you rearrange it into a car and then that car rusts and you put it in a landfill and then it turns to rust. And basically the whole economy is a big rearrangement where you take carbon and iron and you do a huge oxidation reaction and they become rust and CO2. And that's pretty much all an economy is. But to an economist, they kind of prestigidators where you, they pull rabbits out of the hat. So you, to them, you pull, you know, material out of the ground, commodities out of the ground. Then they suddenly appear for the first time. You make them into commodities that now they have extra value. And then basically they, they depreciate and they go off the balance sheet into Never Never Land. And it's like, that's such an infantile way of looking at physics. Uh, and basically what it doesn't uh, allow for is the fact that when technology comes along, you make a technological breakthrough. All you're doing is saying, okay, we've reached the limit on how much CO2, say we can put into the atmosphere. We've saturated uh, basically the footprint that we can allow in emissions or we, we've saturated the, the source, so we ran out of copper or something. And then you substitute something else, but that's all you're doing. So right. if, you, if you say we're going to do kelp, then you say, well, we're going to draw CO2 out of the oceans, but there's a good reason why the oceans aren't covered with kelp already, and that's because they had a limit of iron. So then they say, oh, well, that's no, okay. We can seed the oceans with iron. But you can't just feed the ocean with, with iron because basically the, the kelp is also a dynamic system that then has, um, you know, it's, it's a monoculture. Of, it's a, you essentially putting a marine monocrop of kelp. Yeah, There's we know how well dying. monocultures have worked on land. <laughs> yeah, the, the kelp in California is dying off because of microbes and things. You, 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 one, you one disaster away from an algal bloom that kills all the kelp, it'll all be released as methane. So all, everything you've sequestered and happily done, and basically you've got your carbon right off and it all works within the carbon economy. And there's some company that's basically claiming carbon credits because they put in kelp that all basically in one day will float to the surface as this morass of, uh, you know, basically turn into to, uh, methane in one shot. And so it's terribly, terribly dangerous that these economists are telling us that we can look at the eco-resources and say we can, no, the solution is market forces. Adam Smith was right, everything is the invisible hand. You just let free markets sort everything else out. What's wrong is the pricing is wrong. That's what the, the economists say. And they say that we're not pricing carbon appropriately, so we need carbon taxes to price that properly. And then we're not, we're not uh, pricing the environmental, uh, <clears throat> basically the, envi the ecosystem appropriately. So then we must put a proper price on the oceans and the fish and everything. And you say, okay, this is wrong from two points of view. One of them is uh, what Guy McPherson talks about, and that's that what's the price of the long, last songbird? You can't, it's, it's fatal to actually start pricing uh, bits of the ecology because you've got crucial bits of the ecology that we, we rely on and then you're putting a dollar price on them You soon get to absurd things where you say well the last songbird is probably worth, you know uh, maybe Three million dollars. So therefore 
we can afford to lose $3 million because it doesn't affect GDP. Uh, you, you're going to get to all of these kind of absurdities if you think this way. And if you put taxes on things to um, increase carbon, all you're doing is you're exporting um, manufacturing to... From one place to the other. It just changes exactly. the distribution. It's, it's, it's an exchange. They don't understand that you're just exporting the carbon footprint to China and to the Belt and Road Initiative. And then they say, well, no, we'll put on uh, border taxes, so we'll have carbon taxes at the border. So then, you know, we'll, we'll punish those countries for not being, uh, you know, basically carbon efficient. They said, like, look, the Belt and Road Initiative is 124 countries. They already have a critical mass. They are already flying. They do not need us and our precious little egos in the West where we think that the Chinese are coolies that manufacture stuff for us and we can punish them with tariffs. No, they're here. They're in the it, U.S. It, yeah. So, well, um, well, no, China has exceeded us. China and the Belt and Road, they are the economy now. So all these yeah. conceited Western guys who think of these, you know, in these kind of, um, you know, basically racist terms that, that, you know, we can punish the Chinese with border taxes. It's, it's like, you know, it's, it's, it reminds me of uh, back in the day when um, Britain was so important and, you know, that little island had such self-importance that uh, there's the famous headline in Victorian times in the Times saying, fog in the channel, continent completely cut off. <laughs> of course, it was Britain that was completely cut off. Oh, God. <laughs> but, it, you know, Britons were so so egocentrical that they thought if there's fog in the channel well the continent is cut off <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and, and that's kind of like the carbon taxes at the border it's like we'll put those up and if these countries like uh, belt and road countries don't comply well then they cut off no we're cut off all they're doing is you just handed them a discount on fossil fuels and africa will take that and industrialize and what are they going to do with industrial economy they're going to rip the heart out of our, you know, ecological world. So yeah. the ecosphere is going to be ripped apart by these Belt and Road co countries. Oh, absolutely. You, you've subsidized it by putting a tax on it. So, right. And the GDP, why? I just want to state, is yeah. like a measurement of how much you're taking from the environment. The higher it is, the more environment is being destroyed. So, well... It's a, it's a fake figure, right? The, the, it the is, domestic but, product yeah. is, is pure fantasy. Um, but it leads to uh, concentration on the gross domestic, domestic product. There, there's a lot of things to say, oh, we should have other measurements um, other than GDP. <clears throat> so it should be, you know, well-being constants and th things like that. Um, and then scientists and kind of ivory tower type things, we, we should you know, include things like um, the cost to the environment should be negatives in a new GDP figure. Um, it's all of this is is kind of nonsense. Um, it's it's not uh, any way you account for it. The economy will will find a way around, right? They will find a way um, so that they will destroy the environment and make it look good on the books. So. We, we, if we carry on this, this thing where we're monetizing the, the Earth's uh, the environment, if we monetize the environment and carry on down that path, it'll be a death by a thousand cuts of trick accounting. And I'm very glad that apparently Greta seems to understand that. And she has yeah. mentioned how you know, trick accounting is the way that we will actually choke ourselves and gas ourselves with yeah. CO2. And she's also talked about the fairy tale of eternal growth, which mm -hmm. is important for people to understand. So I don't care if she's being paid by anybody. If she is, good for those people paying her because she is actually trying to spread the truth. The problem I have is the people that only show tidbits of her speeches and 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 don't still leave out those parts about the fairy tale of eternal growth and your your politicians and your policies um, aren't going to solve this. You know, we need the scientists to to come in on it and even then i don't know <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the scientists the scientists uh, will take us down a path that will kill us from a different way um so the the scientists are dangerous as as the economists in a way and the part of it is they have no real world exper experience so <clears throat> they 
they don't understand how you know basically industrial capitalism works and the dynamics of it. So they come up with things that, you know, basically the science says, um, but they, they kind of have a arrested understandings around about high school, it seems to me, because they all kind of goody two shoes and they all imagine that it's all, you know, just about being rational and collecting the data and presenting it. And then it'll, you know, people will be sensible. And it's like, they don't understand what uh, the capitalist economy is all about. And so they come up with things saying, well, the science says we have to keep 50% of the earth uh, pristine in a reserve, and then we can only use 50%. You say, but uh, the fundamental understand, misunderstanding they have is that it's, it's a perpetual growth economy, and it has to be. We, it, only, it, it has negative EROI. Uh, so basically, the uh, energy return on energy invested, EROI or EROEI, is that is uh, is basically negative. So it has to borrow forward from the future, and that's why it's growing. It's growing to catch up with itself. Mm -hmm. so, <clears throat> it's so if we did sequester half the planet as a natural reserve, it would only take, uh, you know, a few generations of increase, say, you know, so every, so basically if we have a 10% 10, 10 growth rate, every seven years we would double. So that other half would quickly come under pressure and overtake the other half. It would only, it would only take um, basically uh, seven years at a 10% growth rate. <clears throat> so that's, that's how the scientists will kill us by naivety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and well, and also they all have their own ideas or like James Hansen in wanting to implement nuclear power. Um, I, uh, there's scientists that disagree on, on what the solution should be, and you don't know who's being paid off, by whom. Uh, the scientists that seem to understand the whole problem, they're, they're not being paid by, by people, at least, the, at least not Jim Massa, he's an independent, he's the guy who's on my show every Monday now, well he has been for the last four, four shows, but um, those people, the ones that really understand the problem, they're not going to be the ones brought in to, to make the solutions there so ah so what should we be demanding let's transfer over to xr since we're about halfway through and i want to leave some time for questions for the people um so the problem is that we are demanding stuff uh, and that's that's really where i'm my daily gripe with uh and grind uh with the uh, with xr uh comes from is the, this fundamental notion that needs to be challenged, uh, that's at the heart of XR, and that's that uh, Roger Hallam's idea that the only entity powerful enough to cope with uh, the climate emergency is national governments. And I'd say that needs to be questioned. Um, the first thing you need to ask yourself is, why have they been so tardy and unresponsive to the emergency? Now, because they're paid off. <laughs> well, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So there's a you can you can run through a number of things why they look like they're being incredibly stupid, and and certainly number two on on the checklist would be that um, they're being paid off. But that doesn't make a lot of sense because um, uh, you know they have kids too, as people point out. Right? They do, um, and so it doesn't make sense from a lot of um, angles. Uh, the you know, I mean, I grew up in the Cold War, and governments um, are hypersensitive to threats. They they paranoid. Um, so we've we've gone through all of these these things like uh, the Cold War, uh, where they've responded. If anything, they've over overreacted to to threats, and then suddenly we get to climate change, and suddenly nothing, no pulse. They don't even fog a mirror with, uh, with climate change. And I don't think people are coming to the right conclusion. I think if you, if you mull it over, there's a very obvious conclusion. And I think the evidence is, uh, is, has been out there for a while. It's just too bleak um, for people to stare. It's just too dark for people to stare it in the face. And, and that's that, you know, if you look at the government documents, the planning, everything since 1972 and the limits to growth, 
the the dialogue the the liberal dialogue says yeah they they heard hansen in 1982 and they ignored him i think i don't think they ignored him in fact i think that there's plenty of evidence that they didn't uh, ignore the limits to growth um they didn't ignore hansen uh, so then you say, well, why has there been so little action? Well, there's been a lot of action. What that action has been is in terms of the security forces, in terms of the analysis. If you look at this, the Council on Foreign Relations and those kind of think tanks, uh, the neocons and all of their thinking, uh, if you run it all the way back to, to about 1982 or even 72 to the limits of growth, uh, they have tons, you know, basically um, containers full of documents about how to how to cope with the the coming crisis uh, and the climate crisis, the crisis of population and the the, the climate crisis, and n you won't see anywhere where they they say, well, we should be mitigating uh, the climate emergency. It's just how to handle the 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 you know basically passively handle the effects of this coming catastrophe. And so it's as obvious as the nose on your face is that they concluded back in at the limits of growth that there's nothing to be done. And that's why they complacent and that's what XR needs to wake up to. They've, they've, they've uh, fallen into this narrative of the government of the authority, which is already very questionable. I mean, they, you know, they are actually followers, not leaders. Um, but the corporate, corporate, uh, the corporate world actually leads more than the government today, um, and so you know that that's a very questionable thing of how Hallam's that you know, the political entities and uh, the state is is supreme. Um, so, but I would say that uh, it doesn't make any sense uh, their their posture, the way they've been behaving about the climate emergency. The only thing that's consistently uh, rings true is that they've concluded long ago that there was no there was no solution um, if you it, now if you say that everybody says oh that's a conspiracy theory and they say like yeah I've heard that all the evidence, all, but all the evidence is there in front of you and so you know I would say to people you know what what are you doing lobbying the government um, but but anyway I don't like the idea of treating the government as an authority um, and um, and, and thinking of this in terms of, of authorities. I think we got here because of authorities. And uh, if we have any chance at all, it's removal, it's removal of authority. Yeah, isn't that what they're trying to do with the Citizens Assembly? No, they're just transferring authority to this uh, thing which they say is, is democracy. But uh, they they saying well it'd be it's just a new authority and probably be worse really what they're talking they 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 thinly disguised revolutionary councils is what they are they say they go back to um, ancient Greece and you know basically um, the uh, that that kind of uh, early democracy where um, but they the citizen assemblies are are actually just revolutionary councils and the 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 other blind spot they they have about citizens assemblies is they they think automatically that they can do a better job than the politicians but the the statistics are already in and the average person in britain say is um is much more conservative about uh, the climate than even the government so so the government is actually more proactive about the climate than your average citizen um, and there, there's plenty of studies and evidence that, that show that. So I don't really understand why XR thinks that citizens' assemblies are some kind of solution. I think it is a big mistake. Um, and uh, they, they would be more conservative, they'd be less, uh, less likely uh, to do things that would, uh, the one thing we need to do, of course, is to basically stop industrialization. The man in the street is far less uh, likely to do anything to hurt the economy or industrialization than even politicians. So, so we just need a, a collapse of the global industrial program. Or program. Well, we get that. We get that for free just by staying the course. But what I'd like to see us is to accelerate it. So I'm an accelerationist. I, I would say we, we've what XR could be doing is accelerating the collapse. 
But what they're trying to do is prevent it. And that's wrong from so many ways. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm an accelerist too. I want to see it collapse. That's why I'm telling people don't freaking buy things. Why are you propping up all the, the, the capitalists and everything? Just stop buying things. I don't know. Well, that's individual action, and it, it can only go so far. Yeah, you can far. only go so far. But, um, but and no one's company, listening. Record sales for Christmas, so obviously no one's listening. Well, <laughs> here's the way to look at it is, is how much time and money does the average person spend actually shopping? Um, not that much. They spend a lot of their time actually working for the system. So they spend 40 hours a week um, or more, maybe 80 hours in America, and they uh, I only work 40 myself <laughs> yeah but uh, for for a lot of people 60 hours is the norm in the gig economy and basically all these people in bullshit jobs um they they try they have three jobs and stuff to try and maintain a yes. city lifestyle a lot of people do yeah so so the vast majority of people's time uh, and income comes from uh working long hours at this work so that's what you need to withdraw so you, basically what we need to do is to start a campaign of sabotage. Those people are propping the system up by working for it. You must basically, you, the system means you have to work. You have to have an income. But it doesn't mean you can't sabotage and wreck it on the side, like uh, basically wreckers did in the Soviet Union. So the Soviet system was authoritarian. It was horrible to live under. And a lot of people that were against it started a campaign of wrecking it to the point where Stalin, you know, had to start shooting people uh, with a charge of wrecking. So wrecking became a very, very serious offense. The reason it became a serious effect, offense was because it was so effective. It was going to bring down <laughs> communism um, by the fact that basically the industrial economy was going to be brought back. So we need to resurrect that in the West. And, and so, how would, what would that look like? Basically, well, uh, you have a lot of leeway. A lot of people are just acting as a counterbalance. I mean, the simplest thing, uh, if, if you're an executive or a middle manager or, some, or have a position like that as a white collar worker, the, the, uh, you don't even have to do monkey wrenching. There, there are armies of people now that are basically acting as counterbalances for all these psychopathic uh, CEOs. Um, and so, you know, you have these guys like Donald Trump, uh, you know, in these positions of power, pure psychopaths. I mean, according to Robert Hare's definition, they are clinical psychopaths. I'll prove it to you if you think I'm being melodramatic or you no. think, oh, sociopaths, maybe. No, psychopaths. They fit the definition perfectly. They check all the boxes. So you have these guys like Donald Trump. And then you have these armies of people around saying, don't worry, we've got your back. We make sure he's not doing any damage. Don't. Encourage him in his destruction. And every CEO that has, has, this, ha, has boards and they have executive teams that are compensating for their, their mania, just stop doing that. Just start encouraging these CEOs to be themselves. Just tell them, why stop there, Bob? Why don't you, you know, double down on that crazy fantasy? And then, then we'd be getting some ways. Basically, people have to stop supporting the system. Just withdrawing support for it would be a, a great first step. And then it goes all the way to the point where you actually start monkey wrenching and start uh, you, having a campaign of stealth to make uh, the gears just, just jam up. Um, and what would that be? So there... Okay, the very first thing to do is to identify all the points of sensitive dependence in the system. And they are very, very sensitive. So um, I've, I've mentioned a few of these on Reddit, but the kind of example that you're looking for is uh, things, things like um, really bottlenecks in the system. Uh, so uh, if you look like, say, a wartime planner back in, say, World War II, there was um, uh, basically a lot of people's job was to try and find points of vulnerability in, in the enemy system and to, to try and exploit them. And one of them that they found was ball bearings. They suddenly realized that ball bearings were in everything. And they were about 80% of them were made in the Schweinfurt factory. 
Um, they sent raids out, uh, two raids. They uh, lost a lot of bomber crews, um, but um, they were dreadfully effective. Uh, Speer, the Ministry of Manufacture, said that you know the, the war would have ended in three months if they had have carried on those raids. So oh, wow. very, very lucky they didn't. But it's, to give you another example on the other side. Uh, there was this uh, generator under um, Grand Central Station uh, called uh, M42. And um, it was so sensitive, um, a bottleneck for the D-Day invasions uh, that anybody that it was under maximum security, anybody infiltrating that would have been shot dead on site. And the reason was that it just generated electricity for the, the Northeast. So all these troops were funneling in, um, going to Britain for D-Day. And the, really place, the only place they could disembark was really in New York. And um, underneath Grand Central Station, secretly, the electricity for all the rail network was generated by these few generators, what they call that, and this substation was called M42. Um, it, if, uh, it basically only needed a handful of sand. A saboteur could have poured a handful of sand into the generator. Um, that would have ended the D-Day invasions. Probably they would have been, had to be delayed till 1945, wow. and we would have lost the war. Now, here's the interesting thing. <laughs> the Germans knew about it. One of the guys who worked in that station went uh, before the war, defected to Germany, and told the Nazis about the crucial sensitivity of this thing. Hitler sent four saboteurs uh, that were landed by submarine on the East Coast, and they went to try and sabotage that. They came very, very close to sabotaging it. Uh, they were actually identified and picked up, um, and uh, two were shot, two went to prison till the 1950s. But Hitler came very, very close to winning World War II with those four guys. Wow. And this incredible story is not really known, but the, the point is that in those days, the system wasn't as fragile as it is today. And in those days, there were such sensitive points of, in, of dependence that a handful of sand could have cost you know, the allies the war. Now, you imagine today how much more sensitive it is. Think of all the guys in these data centers, um, in these uh, gas trading hubs, in all these points of infrastructure. Um, there are people sitting on a button. They kind of, you know, guys in the original Office movie where, you know, it's the guy in the basement thinking, you know, basically the social outcast thinking, you know, I have the button in front of me that could end civilization just at the flick. And I'm saying we need to either get those guys to flick the buttons or otherwise they need to basically dox them and uh, document them so that other people can do it. But that's at the stage that we, we're actually at. And um, that's pretty desperate right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, take, I mean, what else? I mean, so it all depends on how advanced you, you think the emergency is. But as far as I can see, I think we, we are very, very far advanced. And if you look at things like the, the Arctic is uh, a net carbon emitter, uh, we're about at a tipping point on the Amazon. Um, I think we've passed tipping points. Uh, and the Australian. It's, I think at the moment, if everybody started a wrecking campaign, a popular wrecking campaign, it would be a kind of Hail Mary pass. Uh, but that's all we have left to do is to stop the industrial m machine. Uh, by, a lot by of people will possible. die in that process, but a lot well, of not as, not as many as, I, as you think. And then that becomes a big uh, thing that I think you've discussed with Derek Jensen. Derek Jensen gets a lot of this uh, and says, well, a lot of people will die. He say, well, great, but everybody's going to die if we carry on. Yes, it, yeah. That's the point I was going to get to, but I let you make it instead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, but anyway, if, if, if your defense is like, you know, you can't switch off this uh, casino because um, lots of people are surviving, over it, you, may, you might as well, I mean, that's a pathetic moral argument. It's, it's like saying, no, we can't, we can't end slavery because otherwise, who's going to feed the slaves? All the slave masters give the slaves a bowl of rice a day. Where are they going to get their bowl of rice a day? The like, economy. We got to have more people because we yeah. need people to grow the economy. 
so all the people having all these babies, like have babies, have babies, and, and all they are is a tool to grow the economy, destroy the planet, and support the elite. That's it. Yeah, nobody, nobody mentions the, the fact that uh, overpopulation was a result of capitalism. It was uh, basically yes. every authoritarian leader. If you go back to Mussolini and Hitler and, and you know, basically the Americans in the 50s, everybody was encouraged to have babies because uh, there were posters, you know, basta basta posters in, uh, that, that Mussolini had because every, uh, every industrial power suffered a labor shortage you know there was uh, my my family went uh, went out to south africa i was born in south africa but they went out to south africa because of the chronic labor shortage so um basically they were ever the world while it was industrializing had tremendous de demand for labor it's only just stopped now with automation and now basically there's a surplus of labor and, and they're pushing people into, you know, busy work and bullshit jobs and what they call the service economy. But well, it really is just, just really surplus to requirements. The service economy, they could send everybody home tomorrow and it wouldn't, wouldn't affect the economy in the slightest. Oh, absolutely. Do you want to get to questions or did you have any more points? We have, um, oh, we're no, going, okay. great guns. Let's see if anybody's got some questions. <laughs> okay, I'm a little early. So if you have a question, um, but let's say hello while I'm waiting. Hey, Oz. Oz is here. Um, let's see. Trisha, Osama, Scott Marteau, Torstein. Um, oh, hi, Doug. I recognize a lot of those names. <laughs> oh, yeah. Of course you would. Sydney Seeley. This, yes. this is a very, very closed community. I, I, wish, uh, I wish more people were doomers. I know, but the, you know, we're, we're gaining in this community every day. We're getting more people. Um, Cindy Seeley is asking about global dimming. I'm not sure if that's a serious question. Uh, maybe she's new, doesn't understand what global dimming is. Will you explain that really quick while I look for okay, more so, questions? So, well, the, the important thing about global dimming is the McPherson paradox. So uh, for a long time, even since the fifties, they've, some people have noticed that solar radiation has been minimized uh, because of sulfates in the atmosphere. So basically pollution. Um, the, the key study, I think, was this guy in 1948 in Israel um, who did solar, radio, solar measurements to see how much sunshine there were because they knew that basically the Israeli uh, agriculture would have to be irrigated and he had to find out how much irrigation they would require. So he had to know how much evaporation there was. So he did all these experiments in uh, 1948 and then he came back uh, later in the 70s and he thought well what the hell I'll just have a look again and see how the measurements have changed and he was absolutely horrified that the solar uh, radiation reaching the earth was about 30 percent less than 1948 and various people were coming to the same conclusion that solar radiation management has been, and, and evaporation uh, was was chronically hampered. They didn't quite know why, but it was soon pinned down on pollution. <coughs> so that's right. From 9/11, from when they shut down all air travel in the U.S., the temperatures raised. Yeah, they, was it a degree? I think it was a degree or something. Like yeah, that. and the same. Uh, McPherson says the same happened with um, when when they uh, went over to nuclear in uh, in France. Uh, that caused a, a noticeable spike in, in local temperatures. But there was, there was a, in the island, islands in the Philippines, uh, there was a very direct result where they could see it. And that was uh, this, these two islands that were, um, or one island that was upstream from two industrial centers. So uh, one had an industrial center, and then very similar, just slightly south from that, had basically clean air without any industry on it. Uh, similar island up to, and, and then they clearly showed that there was a, about a degree difference if you were downstream from an industrial area. So that, that was very definitive. But anyway, Hansen came out and did a defining paper, I think in about 2003 on it. And he's, he pointed out that, look, if, um, if we, quit all this industrial activity, we, uh, we're going to raise the temperature. He said about 0.8 of a degree Celsius um, and one degree Fahrenheit about. And uh, he said, well, you've got to add that in 
um, to the, you know, basically global heating. Um, the IPCC does that. Um, they do actually, if you have a look on the, uh, on the charts, they do have a little bar graph where it's uh, the, the temperature sensitivity of the earth is actually reduced by the global dimming effect. If they have a little blue negative bar there. Uh, so they do take it into account. Um, it's not very clear whether they taking it into account enough, um, but McPherson is, it's, it's really dominated his whole life uh, to the, the global dimming effect and what he calls the McPherson paradox, that if we do shut down all the power stations and they stop putting out sulfates in the air, um, basically we would have about a degree warming, so we kind of screwed. So yeah. he thinks, you know, oh, you can't stop industrial civilization because otherwise we're going to go extinct sooner, which is like saying, I can't stop drinking now because I'm going to have a hell of a hangover anyway. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's, the next, it's not logical to say that. And it's very anthropocentric to say that because you say, well, this is all about us and us going extinct. And I think there's more uh, on the table than that. I would also say that nobody really knows it's a complicated effect. Um, it's not simply that all the soot uh, basically this drops the sun, out like uh, yeah basically the, the because if it was just blocking out the sun then they, the the soot would absorb all the solar radiation and it would turn into heat it would just be slightly above the ground maybe about a thousand feet above the ground and so it would be uh, factored into satellite measurements of the temperature now the reason is it isn't is because it's it's actually quite complicated what those sulfates do is they cause moisture in the air uh, and the moisture raises the albedo of the Earth. So it reflects the solar radiation back into space. Although radiation from the, uh, the pollution from the ground looks dense and black, from space it's actually brighter and reflects back. But now, uh, water vapor itself is one of the most potent greenhouse gases. So uh, this quickly gets really complicated and various models say various results. They just had this one thing from Jerusalem University saying it's way worse than we thought. It's twice what we thought. It's like two degrees. These other guys came back, said, no, what it does is if you, when you take it out, there are more clouds and those compensate for the albedo and there's almost no global dimming effect. Yeah, so, so it's no use counting on is, that. Yeah, the net result but is uh, McPherson is overplaying this. He shouldn't have based his whole life on this. There's not enough data and we shouldn't and basically as things stand we know what happens if we carry on emitting CO2. Uh, we, if we keep these coal-fired power stations going then we absolutely know what the effect is. We don't know the effect of stopping them and if on the off chance that we said oh no a big mistake you can start them up again tomorrow. But basically the, the coal fields in China that have been burning for uh, about 20 years now. They can't put them out, basically. They're burning underground, uh, even in America. That's happening in Utah, too. In yeah, in Utah, too. They've, they've had yeah. these, these fires burning in coal fields since the 50s. And, uh, you know, you could just ignite all the open coal fields if you, if you really wanted to make a big dimming effect. So, so it's, basically, it's a nonsense argument. We have to stop industrial civilization and we'll, we'll, it's an afterthought. The global dimming effect and all the people around McPherson that make a big hoo-ha out of it is say, you, you don't, you, there's not enough data to make a hoo-ha. And even if there was, uh, we have to kick the habit. It's no excuse for carrying on. Right. That's okay, it. Let's That's move on global to dimming. Sorry about there that. There you go. Good. No, that was, that was a very in-depth answer. So appreciate that. Oh, so more in-depth than she probably wanted. But anyway. Probably. Okay, so, oh, by the way, hi, CV joined us, and Ben Wilbur um, has a question. Have you heard of about Victor Schauberger's work? I don't know if I said that right, Schauberger's? No. What, what's that? S-C-H-A-U-B-E-R-G-E-R-S. Is he the economist? I don't know. I don't know, Ben. Um, is he the economist? Let's see. Any more questions? Oh, my gosh. Slow down. Um, where was I? Where was I? Okay, there I am. What about the one Kaz, Kaz, 
Kazakhstan. I can't say Kazakhstan. That's hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was lightning rod. I don't know what the one is. Uh, uh, well, uh, something to do with Borat. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, Torsten has a question. Lord, have you looked more into the vulnerabilities database run by the one of XR's thinkers, Buddhists? Yeah, so, so there's this thing called, called truthteller.org or truthteller.net. Um, and they've, uh, Gail's mentioned it, uh, Roger Highland's mentioned it. I don't know if how much it's being used, but what it was set up for was for uh, doxing vulnerabilities in the system. On the basis that, you know, it was kind of, um, and also being, being a whistleblower uh, site for, you know, uh, Exxon knew yonks ago, or, you know, Exxon doesn't care and all of this stuff. But I, I don't think that that's very useful. Everybody knows the system is fragile. But what that site could be used for is for exactly what I'm saying, is having people dox vulnerabilities in the system. So that if the if basically there are uh, really people that are prepared to use a variety of tactics, um, they they these points or uh, nodal points uh, basically should be out there and known, and they could be done on a very benign kind of uh, basis, very unthreatening way to say no. I'm a goody two shoes. I'm a good citizen. Just telling you about a vulnerability in the system. They yes. Can, so yeah. they're basically the keys under the mat. You just take the key, put it in the thing, <laughs> flip the switch. And I'm just saying that, you know, the state needs to know about that because it's a security hole. <laughs> and then if we have a huge catalog of those, um, at some point, uh, at some point, people are going to wake up. And then uh, they're going to be more than enough people to actually hamstring the system. Um, nice. But it would be really good to have a database like that to tell people that are, you know, basically you get different categories of people. Then a lot of people can actually point fingers, uh, spread information about the vulnerabilities in the system. Basically, people can develop target lists. Mm -hmm. um, there's quite a different mindset that goes into actually targeting these things. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, basically we should, we should collaborate on those first. We basically should get those points out and it's fine if it's done on the basis of we're just good citizens, um, just pointing out to people just how fragile this is and preparing for deep That's adaptation. Well, part point. of deep adaptation is sticking a monkey wrench in these things. I like that. Okay, Cindy just had a comment. She said, good point, Lord, you start industry back up if we need to cool it down. Um, thank you, Cindy. That was a that was good. Um, and, and thank you, Torstein, for your question. That was an excellent, excellent question with an excellent answer. Uh, let's see. Victor Schauberger, an Aus Austrian forest caretaker, naturalist, Paris scientist, philosopher, inventor, and bio, bio <laughs> mimicry experimenter. Schauberger developed his own ideas based on what he observed in nature. Oh, okay. So it's okay. polymath. Yeah. 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 Um, no, I don't. I don't really know about him, but he sounds a bit like E.O. Wilson and uh, those kind of guys. Um, is it, is he from any kind of particular school of thought, like the cyberneticists or the posthumanists or anything, or is he just his his own kind of um, um, geodesic dome? Bella. Uh, it doesn't really stay in that comment, so we'll, we may have to look into that later and try to get into yeah. it. Um, yeah, the mimicking nature, the biomimicry. What do you, well, I'm, well, the, I, there's I, another I, question. Well, but, yeah, this, uh, this is more this crazy stuff that drives me wild, like uh, CRISPR and all of the, that we're heading off uh, into the twilight zone. The, the, you know, these people are crazy. They, they talk about, oh, we could have artificial trees and stuff like that. Um, and say, why? We've got real trees. Why, why does everything have to be substituted and artificial and engineered? Uh, yeah, nature can but, do it so much better. But I'll like, tell you a big danger about biomimicry 
And that's this kind of forgotten thing from the 80s called Biosphere 2. So Biosphere 2, I believe, uh, it's considered a big failure because they couldn't get it to, to work. But I think that a lot of people took some lessons from Biosphere 2, including governments. And it's worth looking at because I think that Biosphere 2 encouraged governments to think that there is no way out of the climate predicament. Uh, and, and, but it was forgotten in mainstream science because what was supposed to be was, do you, do you remember what Biosphere 2 was? <laughs> so, so basically in the 80s, they got this huge, uh, really glass house that was supposed to be, you know, Biosphere 1 is the earth. They made Biosphere 2 was a completely sealed environment where they mimic all of Earth's systems. They put about 12 people in, and then they tried to, you know, they had oceans and they had uh, plants, and they tried to mimic the deserts and the jungles and everything. And it was, it was a prelude to having um, off-world uh, colonies. So these were, if these had worked, they would have taken them into space and uh, to colonize Mars and things like that. It failed miserably. And the reason why it failed was because of CO2. Basically, they, they, the guys couldn't uh, sustain themselves. They got thinner and thinner. The whole politics, it all completely broke up. Um, they had to leave the biosphere. Um, but they had uh, insects like ants started to run wild. Um, mm -hmm. And, and um, they, they had to sneak in a CO2 scrubber. It was basically like a big submarine, and they were forced to put in a CO2 scrubber, which is basically straight out of a submarine, I think they got it from. Um, and so what it encouraged, I think, government scientists to think was that <clears throat> those kind of space colonies, you, you, suddenly you hear space talk about space colonies that, that I had in my youth suddenly dried up after that. Uh, I went down in the media and the popular imagination as a failure because we thought, oh, this is all part of the Star Trek future. And then when it all collapsed and burned, it was all kind of an embarrassment and everybody swept it under the rug. I think there's a faction of people that didn't take it and, and sweep it under the rug. I personally think it was a great success as an experiment because it proved the scale that you could have a biosphere. And it just happens to be the size of the biosphere. You cannot yeah. make this biosphere smaller. Uh, so it was a great scientific result. And I think some people got the message. Um, and I think it affected government policy, but it's just a hunch. Anyway, go and have a look at Biosphere 2. That is seriously good I will, education. That <laughs> is interesting. I absolutely will. Let's get as many questions as we can. Because of the CO2. They couldn't control the CO2, and that's why wow. I failed. That I'm going to so look into that. Thank you for yeah. that. Um, biosphere too, right? Okay, all right. So we may go a little over um, because I want to get to our questions. So <laughs> um, Oz Lefebvre asked, do you think the U.S. empire will ever end their war making for profit, which is a huge contributor, contributor to the crisis? They're gonna, you see, this is part of uh, what gets me up in the morning and motivated is trying to avoid a future, which I think I've seen before. And I'm telling you, they will hold on to the bitter end. The, what is frightening, I don't think people realize, particularly collapsitarians, is how long the state can hang on for. It can hang on right to the bitter end. If you Basically, if you want to get a good insight into a state's in collapse, uh, look at Nazi Germany. And, and it's just horrific how the state behaved in the final days uh, of the Reich. Um, and that's what we headed for. I saw this in South Africa. We came very, very close to a Rwanda-style genocide. Um, and the, my takeaway from, from living uh, in the South African experience was, uh, Roger Hallam and XR, you're absolutely, absolutely fundamentally underestimating the power of violence. It's basically white people were 20% of the population, and we held onto the country for decades by raw power of a gun. <laughs> Don't right. underestimate it. You are not being realistic with your Gandhi BS and stuff like that. It's basically, <laughs> the violence is powerful like you won't believe. Uh, relatively few people can hold on to a big country. 80% of, yeah, forget about 3.5%. In South Africa, 80% 80% of the population was against the government. And they didn't make a dent. Why? Because of violence, violence. 
Violence mm. is important. It's, uh, you'll never get anywhere with uh, NVDA. Just, just get over it the sooner than better. <sighs> Yeah, I don't think we'll get anywhere. But, but, anyway. but just one more thing while I'm having a rant here. Uh, whoever asked that question, uh, it's well worth uh, looking at Rebecca Solnit and um, uh, Paradise is Built in Hell is, is her book. Um, it's about San Francisco and Katrina, and it gives you a good idea about how your worst enemy in collapse is the state. You, you, we really have to neutralize and anesthetize quarantine uh, states before collapse gets too far because the state is not your friend you'll find that out uh, during the collapse all right they'll be trying to control you and the resources whatever they might be but chris foster it's kind of related if we crash the industrial economy what do we replace it with nothing what do you replace cancer with? i know was... you replace cancer with with what <laughs> um this yeah. is an old anarchist question. Yes, uh, anarchy. Have always, uh, always responded to this with, what do you replace cancer with? So, and there's, there's another related thing is saying like, how can we do with electricity? Look, we only had electricity for, for 100 years and two, two million people, two billion people don't have electricity. It's basically, we were doing fine without electricity. We can so, survive without electricity. We won't be able to do this. But I'm okay with that. We don't, we don't need to. If we, if we, we only have to do this because of electricity. It's, it's what separated us. We, yeah. we would be next door neighbors if we didn't have electricity, right? Yep. Baya has a good comment. Life, life equals suffering. Someone will always suffer or everyone will. No, 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 no. This is Jordan Peterson. <laughs> Oh no, is it Jordan Peterson? Life, this is this is oh, what, don't this quote is Jordan Peterson. State, this, this is what the state, this is what Jordan Peterson said. Jordan Peterson has got this rant on video going, life is suffering. That's what the religious people always told us and say, yes, Jordan, that's what the religious people told you. Why? Because they're in cahoots with the slave owners. This is a labor camp. We are not supposed to suffer in a labor camp. No, no, no. Basically, we weren't suffering before industrialization. The hunter-gatherers right. didn't suffer. Right, right. Don't have a look at the Piraha people. They're the happiest people in the world. Why? Because they can only count to three. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Okay, let's see. Uh, Professor Peter Newman and British expert and one on oh no, Copenhagen Uni on climate change and the burning of Australia. I guess Tricia has a good link um, on there. Let's see. Guess on timeline for full collapse in the West. Thank you, Trish Kaiser. Kaiser. Do you have a guess for the timeline? Full collapse in the West? So, yeah, this is a dangerous game to play because it's really complex. Um, I'm I'm not good at timelines. I'm great at telling you what's going to happen, but it's an order of magnitude to tell you when, and it's kind of a fool's game because you just have to get like, get a dry twig and bend it over your knee. You know, it's going to break at some stage. Um, right. It's very, very hard to call it. Um, I, I, I remember when I was, uh, when I was in my twenties uh, in South Africa, it's a very complex situation, kind of like the same question. And then people were knew we were heading for genocide. And that, that question was phrased as, how long would it take to get a black government? In other words, you know, basically, we would probably be wind up shot dead. And uh, basically, there'd be a revolution and we'd be superseded. So uh, people generally said, uh, not in my lifetime. You know, young people in their 20s said, not in my lifetime. I had vicious arguments with people. And I said, no, nah, 10 years. Um, and I was wrong. It was actually six. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But yeah, I mean, guessing is hard. But okay, so they're saying they're um, they're saying thirty years, like on in the major uh, media. Don't make any plans beyond twenty fifty. I can say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're pretty close. I mean, I, I, and it can happen much faster. It's, so, it's, it's happening much faster. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. exponential. You see, what are these people are doing is they, they're thinking of it as too gradual, but the scientists are kind of being coy about the fact that everything's coupled. It's closely coupled, and it's actually getting more coupled, not decoupled. 
So when it goes, uh, they're not only feedback loops, they're close couplings. And in a scale-free network, you only need a few preferential nodes to go and the whole thing's gone. So basically what scientists are being coy about is that collapse is gonna come abruptly. And everybody, the conversation is all, you know, IPC says by 2100, we should have this and all the graphs are so damn smooth and stuff. It's like, forget it. If you see a, a smooth graph, you're talking to an idiot because sure. he doesn't understand. You're like a graph. hockey stick or a check mark. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's an exponential growth. It's been an exponential growth for a long time. And that's, uh, they don't show you exponential graphs. No, they don't. Um, Cornholio is here. Welcome, Cornholio. Glad you made it. He never makes it to my live streams because of time differences. Um, so let's see if there's any more questions. Because we're already over, but I want to see if I can get, uh, see if there's any more. I stopped the comments where I was, so I wouldn't miss any. Um, there's as a comment. Prime Minister had to cut short holiday off. Sky oh, wait, never mind. Yeah, the Prime Minister of Australia was in Hawaii and he had to fly back. But there again, uh -huh. why do we care? It's, it's again this this attention to authority figures. We've got to get I know. I don't, it's, I then, there's that. no solution in authority figures, guys. Forget about what the authority figures do. Forget about what Trump and Boris and all of these guys do. There's the only authority figures you need to care about are Xi Jinping, uh, Jair Bolsonaro, and Mahendra Modi. And basically, you only need to care about them because they need to be. Yeah, they need to. I'm not going to say that out loud, but yeah, <laughs> I agree. Um, Donald McCarthy is here. Um, cool. <laughs> uh, Sky News Australia is still denying anything out of the ordinary. Bomb massaging, or is it BOM massaging figures to conceal greater heat in the past? What the fuck? Yeah, I, I can't believe Sky News Australia is just like mm. in denial, complete and total denial. It's wow. Yeah, it's, um, basically, it's because they've survived on China and mining. And so they they stuck, they cornered, they're trapped. Yep, we're, I think we're all kind of painted into a corner. Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah, I was posting a link of some variety. Amazon. Anyway, you know, the only reason why they've got fires in Australia is because they don't do forest management and they don't sweep up the pine needles properly. Oh, God. <laughs> uh, that, we'd be better off fun. if we just stayed out of the forest because what we have been doing has made it worse. And plus the warming allows for those beetles to overwinter, you know, the pine beetles. And then, and then there's more of them the next season, so they're killing more trees and making them more vulnerable to fire. I, 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 no jokes. Uh, this uh, friend of mine, friend of mine, well, this guy I know, who's a billionaire friend of uh, Theresa May, he's got one foot in Australia, one foot in South Africa, one foot in, in the UK. But anyway, this guy uh, sends out emails to his email list, and I just like to be on it so because I can see how the 1% think. And he sends all this stuff out saying that the fires in Australia are caused by, wait for it, wait for it, because they all these green people are preserving forests. So basically, if you, if you have a look at the growth in the amount of forests in Australia, they've been going up and up, and so have the fires. And that's the reason. If, if we allowed logging, we wouldn't have these fires now. Ta-da! <laughs> I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> it's like, are oh, you left the trees up? Why well, you shouldn't complain now? They're burning all you green people. <laughs> that is insane. That's the way they think, man. Everything's upside wow. down. For them. Everything's upside down for them. Well, they are on the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> According to him, he's a wealth creator because uh, no, nobody will get off their ass and basically build a, a civilization without people like him. Oh my god. Oh my God. Uh, what the, that's why I have no hope for this planet. Zero. It's things like that. And I can't even convince people in my family that this is a real thing happening. Oh, they said it was, you know, we were going to be overpopulated back in the 70s. It hasn't happened yet. Yeah. Hell, it hasn't happened yet. Oh my God. Think how many people, you know, 
that predicted the apocalypse, and all of them were wrong. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. that means the apocalypse can't yeah. happen. Um, great Y2K, <laughs> it's like, we're all going to die, or something major is going to happen in Y2K because of the computers or something. And it was like, I didn't even blink an eye. I didn't care. <laughs> well, in, in the like, past, oh, well, what if power goes out? Do I really care? Do I give a shit? No. <laughs> the millenarians in, in the past were always wrong, but, uh, you know, basically, the, pro the thing about prophets of doom is they only have to be right once. Basically, yep. people that are uh, Whiggish and um, uh, have, have this progressivism, then um, they, they have to be right every single time. Yep. <laughs> Oh, I don't, yeah. I, I, I understand that I will be wrong often. So whatever, you know, you can be wrong. It's okay to accept the fact that you can be wrong and learn something new. But a lot of people don't have that mindset. They just think they need to be right. And that was that's more important than getting to the truth. So Well, the truth that. is pretty scary, I've got to admit. It gets scary. It is pretty scary, yeah. It's very scary. Every every now and again, I must admit that I do lapse, and I just think, "Oh man, I want to be one of these guys. I I just want to want to think like them and not worry." I know what, when ignorance is bliss, right? Yeah, no, but this like this this billionaire guy. He says um, he says, uh, "I don't know what's wrong with these people. They they think in an austerity and they think in a small way and reduce, reduce, reduce." He says. Live abundantly. That's what I tell everybody. Live abundantly. This is a billionaire, right? He, he just like oh, yeah. off Good. the planet. He says, I don't know why people don't listen to me. It's much better to live abundantly than have all this austerity that people want to impose on themselves. He said, this is literally what he says. And, and, is, and again, I thought, Psychopath. You know, I just, I just <laughs> want to be him. I, I am getting sick of this too much. Too much right? Too. <laughs> I want to live in denial. Oh, wouldn't that be nice to live in that land of denial? As a it's billionaire? A, it's, yeah. It's a paradise in denial. Let's see. Yeah. Donald. I think we're being the stupid ones. I really do sometimes. Oh my gosh. Donald thinks we look like brother and sister. <laughs> <laughs> kind of doomer carpenters. Well, that's a great compliment to me. <laughs> and a real distance. <laughs> Okay, you're officially my older brother. <laughs> I hope you're older. <laughs> I'm getting little. really senior rights now. When I when I go down to the shop here in Greece, twice now they've given me these comforter blankets for free. <laughs> I'm like I'm getting like sad old man status now. You know, it's like I'm six years away from being a senior. Six years. If I make it to be a what, senior, what, you what's know. a senior? In, here you get your senior discount at fifty-five. Right. Okay, I'm 54, so I'm going to move to Utah and get. <laughs> it's just it's not, you don't get your benefits like Social Security or anything until your 60s, 70s. I'll never see that, but yeah. you, but you'll get discounts in stores and restaurants and stuff. So, yeah, if, if you had buses, you get 50 percent on that. Hey, you know yeah. all that stuff is going away uh, in Greece. It's going away. Get used to that, man. They, they, all the seniors here, they just lost their 50 percent discount on the oh, bus. Oh wow. I think That's seniors get a free national parks pass too here so they can go uh, into all the national parks. In, in Greece, uh, you go to the, all the parks for free. It's just dumb tourists that get hit up. Well, the, parks and monuments. the U.S. is stupid. They charge you a fortune. I think it's $75 for a day pass or something. What? Normally. Like Yosemite? Yeah, I think so. I, I never go into those big, big parks. I go into the national forest, but I don't go into the big national parks on a regular basis. Wow. Uh, did I say hi to human yet? Lens. I don't know. Hi human in case I didn't say hello to you. Thank you for coming. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you. <laughs> no, no, I do. I just lamenting that that money doesn't go to the environment. It just goes straight to the treasury. Oh, and it goes to build more roads and trails and stuff like that instead of actually helping. Yeah. And then they pack people into these national parks. They pack them in. They're so busy. So in a way, I'm kind of happy they charge more for it because they are so packed. They're mm. insanely packed. They have to limit some places because there's just too many people. Yeah, Yosemite is a car park now, isn't it? Mm. Human has a poet, a poem called "Painted, Painted into a Corner." 
Sounds like a good poem. <laughs> uh, yeah, Oz, thank you. Please hit the thumbs up. Please, please. And if you're not subscribed, please subscribe. I'm trying to hit a thousand. I am so close. I am under a hundred left to, to go. So got a, almost a thousand subscribers. Uh huh. You've got almost a thousand subscribers. Yeah, I'm at nine hundred and thirty-seven last time I looked. So. Oh, cool. I'm getting there. I yeah. I really need it so I can stream live. I can give you messages, you know, in the feed on YouTube, and you know, if I like have to cancel a video or or if I have something coming up, I can let you know. Um, oh, oh, would you promote my book? I'm, I, I'm just about finished my novel on climate change, and uh, I'm, as soon as I release it for small money, maybe even free. <laughs> oh, nice. Is it where's it going to be at? Is it going to be an ebook or is it going to be an actual? Yeah, I'll probably put it one of those things where you can just self publish as an ebook or whatever those things are. Okay, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. What's going to be the name of it? Did you already say that? And I was distracted. Uh, no, no. It's, um, it's called St. George and the Methane Dragon. Oh. And what? yeah, it's basically climate change, um, basically collapse imagined from a Greek island uh, point of view. Um, but it's not all doom and gloom. It's, um, and it has a black swan in it, which I think is rather intriguing. Um, you know, basically. Oh, yeah. I was very pleased that I thought of this. Val part. should like that. I don't know if I said hi to Val. But anyway, <laughs> it has a black swan, so there's like... Yeah, I, so I was very pleased to think of a black swan because it made me feel that, you know, it's it's complicated thing about collapse and the climate. And so it's nice that if I, I thought, if I could think up one plausible one, there are probably others out there and that's kind of nice. Yeah. That makes you feel a little bit better, but I still want to see civilization collapse. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you no, no, it's, it doesn't mean civilization doesn't collapse. It just means that collapse might not be quite what you think. Yep. Okay. Torstein's promoting your book. You put the title of it down there for you. Um, thank you, Torstein, for, for, you know, cheering me on. I love it. And, and if, you haven't, if you haven't subbed to Going South, do that too. And also, Lord, you are a dumbass on YouTube is, is Lord's channel. And escape, escape with uh, Lord, you are a doomba. Oh, yeah, that's right. I always miss that first part. Yeah, and also doomba. CCTV, Climate Change TV. Talks yes, frozenearth.com. So check that out. I don't know if I said a lot of lightning rod. Um, who else did I see? Book Hermit is here late but book comments here Think about finding mm -hmm. truth is recognizing it once you stumble across it um yeah good point uh, um let's see trisha i think i said that. we all need infrared glasses to see the methane around us <laughs> methane <dragon. laughs> sorry i'm reading comments um as far as the economy goes, it just depends on how long we keep letting the ultra rich print themselves endless money. Yeah, well, yeah, there's that. The I mean, they're paying off the banks right now. Uh, like yeah, that, that's one thing is, is look out on uh, December the 31st. Uh, there could be a little wrinkle in the matrix uh, on that okay. score. New Year's Eve. Yeah, the, the, the banks have to, um, they have to have minimum reserves when they close their books on December the 31st. And it looks like some egregious players, maybe JP Morgan and uh, a few others have, uh, then they short on cash. And uh, that's part of the reason why the Fed has been pumping uh, billions a day into the markets. But the Fed has been buying up on the repo market. And uh, all is not good. Yeah, on, no, it's... on September, the overnight rate went to 10%, um, which is sort of a debacle. Oh, no, light, I think Lightning Rod's a big fan. He says, you're a hero. You are all heroes and prophets to me. You are serving humanity. So thanks for that. That's awesome of you to say, Lightning Rod. Um, Very nice. There's already enough wrinkles in the matrix, <laughs> says Trisha. No, they're not um, enough. They're going to be more. Then we need to have cracks. We need to start chiseling at them, man. 
<laughs> exactly. We need to find the little the glitch. Put, yeah, put a crowbar in the. Crow, in yeah, the that's what I'm saying. The matrix, matrix. Put a crowbar in it, Matt. They would just keep me getting endless zero interest loans. Yeah. Y twenty twenty k. Tourist site. Um. Spellberg, but the banks and in international settlements will take care of everything. Long live Bretton Woods. Uh, yeah, the BIS is, is uh, getting nervous. Uh, Deutsche Bank is in trouble. Uh, things are not looking good. No, Everybody knows that this house of cards is coming down and nobody quite knows how. Um, and the reason is MMT, they can just print money up the yin yang, but they can't print it out indefinitely. Because if you watch my very first episode of my very first video, I'll explain, I explain how the financial system works and, and what MMT people don't realize is we actually pay 6% on our money. We pay 6% interest. So the national debt is not for free and we've got to the end. We can't service that 6% anymore. Uh, yeah, this is. Uh, no, it's nothing to be. I'd like to see that. It's, it's a good to thing. Be about. <laughs> you, 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 no, I want to see that. I'm, I'm sighing because, you know, I get excited about something like that and then it never happens. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the financial collapse is the thing that just carries on never happening in the most remarkable way. Um, yeah, it's. But, you know, just like the climate is collapsing, the financial system is collapsing too. Um, and nobody's really looking very hard at it. But there, there's right. serious cracks in it. Right. So we're, we're over by about 23 minutes. I do have chores to get to. So I'm going to let you have any last word, anything else you want to say to our lovely people. Um, gosh, all you guys, thank you so much for coming on a Saturday. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks for moving the time. And uh, yeah, I had a lot of fun. So uh, thanks for letting me to rant a bit. It was kind of nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's always fun to rant, right? I, I get off on ranting. It just makes me feel so much better. <laughs> yeah, I feel good. <laughs> I, I hope I didn't lean on everybody and make them feel bad at the end of my rant. But uh, yeah, I, I, I've, enjoyed, <laughs> I've enjoyed spouting. <laughs> Okay, this guy o. Smith is here. We won't like the new Stone Age. Probably not, but what do you do? Um, oh, no, you'll love it. You'll love it. Just go, go and read, read up on how it used to be. It's fantastic. It's yeah. Fantastic. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to live in a more simple life. I would love it's it so much. hunting and fishing, and everybody, everybody plays big money to go on hunting and fishing holidays now. You used to get them for free. It's way better. I love camping. I love being off-grid, so. So do I. It's just the thing, so. William Martyr is here. You came late. Okay, watch the replay, William. Um, thanks for coming. Love you much. Um, one more comment. Okay, I'm done after this. Extinction is exciting and it won't disappoint. <laughs> That's good. I like it. I like <laughs> yes. it. I, this is the finale. This is this is the most exciting reel. Don't don't uh, don't miss this one. It's gonna be great. Cool. Absolutely. Oh wait, I have to read Oz's comment because you know he's my engineer and stuff my partner in crime. He says, thank you, Lord Hugh. Will you join us again soon? Oh, I'd love to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, especially to promote my novel. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I will. If somebody's definitely. dumb enough to read it, maybe we could discuss it. That would be cool. <laughs> right. Oh, shoot. I forgot to set up the... Oh, no, I don't have to do that anymore. Dad, my thing is working. All right. Say goodbye. You guys, have a very good a good weekend and happy holidays hopefully it's a giftless okay. holiday and just yeah. happy holidays enjoy time with everybody yeah all right i'll see you monday talk to you guys soon bye-bye